Hey, do we have a, uh, is there like any specific topics tonight we're trying to get to, or is it just kind of like open discussion? Yeah, today we're just going to uh, open, yeah, flatter for chill, open discussion, uh, ask me anything, uh, recent topics, uh, recent uh, events, anything that happened in the community, you know, kind of just kicking it uh, this week. We, we were really like information heavy the past couple weeks. Right. No, I like that. That's cool. That's cool. I see yeah. Alan's, front. Alan's here now. I was just about to say that. I see my yeah. man Alan pulled up. You good, bro? Yo, what up? How's my mic tonight? Perfect. My man. For now. Nice. For now. Right, it's for now. <laughs> for now. Yo, I can good? hear you, bro, until it starts to do what it does. <laughs> nice. Yo, what's good, gentlemen? I can't hear Alan. No, proud. What's up? Mic check for proud. Nothing? Proud you don't hear Alan? God proud, dang it, proud. Elon. No, it doesn't show him as a speaker. I could yeah. I could, I could drop and come back. Yeah, drop and come back. I can hear both of them, but yeah. Yeah. Dude, have you have you checked the timeline this week, Sacred? There's been a lot of discussion about a gentleman with a telescope and a and water. Really? Hey, yeah. I was telling my guys, like, fill me in. Because I heard everybody was real active in the field this week. But I don't know. It seemed like everybody uh, that was pretty much active isn't here for the conversation. I wonder why. Dude, it it was crazy. First, Shane hit him with a little trigonometry. Nobody was expecting that. Like, right out of left field. Just, or just an uppercut, right? With some trigonometry, dude. Straight to the dome. And uh, literally a dome, you know. with <laughs> In trigonometry. Linearly. All, all, logarithmically uh all of it so anyway we got <laughs> and uh and on top of that you know there was a real there was a heated debate about airy and his telescope and what happened when he filled it with water a lot of a lot of confusion so well, what's the debate about it there's nothing well, to debate airy success well it seems that he failed right that there's this there's this air of failure surrounding airy that the that his that he failed to detect something, so I'm here tonight, you know, especially right because it is a AMA tonight, right? So one of the things that anyone can AMA me is about Aries' failure, his failure to detect Earth's orbital velocity. All right, hey, so, that's how I read it up. Yeah, I read it just like that. So if anyone wants to get into the specifics of that and explain that as from the heliocentric position where the where the uh where the water carries the light from the star in the opposite direction of motion, you can tell me all about that mechanism and what causes it. Is it Coriolis? Is it is it do the absolute are the absolute fixed stars involved? Somebody help me out. I'm <laughs> super confused. Maybe we can get it maybe we can get a reference frame change in here. I don't know probably the same reason for the double stellar parallax going half the other, other direction i bet oh dude yeah yeah yeah, yeah probably maybe, related yeah maybe we could talk to that guy or a brick wall for another hour and a half maybe it's like some relativistic refraction is that like a thing yeah do we get to that part in physics uh, yeah i think we got to that one yet but that will be invoked at a, at a certain point in time it, it else, has to be if all else <laughs> fails you throw you pull the relativistic uh, Doppler effect, and you just pull the pin and fucking throw it. Maybe it'll explode flat like uh, the Big Bang in the universe. Oh, yeah. You're talking about the symmetry of the universe? <laughs> yeah. Then the old flatness problem? Yeah. Jane, how did they solve the old flatness problem anyway when they were mapping the old universe to the ground? Yeah, well, they mapped the, the world to the ground. I don't know how they mapped the universe, like, but I guess they did the same thing because I don't know what you align to out there in the land of mysticism, nothing in you know, space demons. But down here, they applied geoastrogenics and they had this wonderful idea to map the celestial sphere right onto the geoid. And that's how we got all the maps we have today. Wow. So you could just transpose the stars right onto the ground and then make corrections based off of that and tell everyone that you're... Yeah, that that the arcs that you're using to derive distance and location are actually based off of the curvature on which you're standing on, and not the thing you're using in the sky to navigate to. 
It'd be tricky to do it otherwise, right? If you're living on a flat plane and you have a sky that curves, but then you take a, just say you mark a triangle from a distance in that curved sky, and then you translate that curved sky arc to the ground, which is flat. I don't know, man. It seems like they could manufacture curvature. Hmm. So, well, so you're telling me that you could go around, take observations of the, st- take, take like physical observations on the ground and then transform those to, you know, sea level, right, per se, right? And then see how much you've deviated from a star map and then make corrections like, you know, I don't know, deflect your vertical per se to make sure that you're perpendicular with the gravitational potential of the geoid itself that you're presupposing to measure in the first place. And then you can- Insinuating <laughs> the point of geodesic surveying isn't to map the Earth, that is actually to mark when they make corrections to the celestial sphere and then actually correct points to the celestial sphere and then actually uh, correct it with the correction table to the celestial sphere. Actually, there's a lot of celestial sphere going on, but that's not what they're doing out there. Well, isn't it called astrogeodetic surveying, but most people just refer to it as geodetic surveying, completely dropping the presupposed astro that they're confirming to? <laughs> so it's almost as if instead of... You could say all great circle routes intersect the center of a f- hypothetical ball that no one's ever been able to get to the center of, that it's more actually apt to say that all great circle routes intersect a celestial sphere in the sky that they use to navigate on the ground. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Dude. All roads cross at the celestial sphere crossing. Huh. That's, that's really interesting. So you're saying that everyone that shows a map and then says a flat earth prediction of this distance is this. And then the globe distance that I'm referencing on my globe map that's derived from the stars. That's, that's based off of arcs to the, in that, in that map system that perfectly matches the globe. You're saying that would be a completely retarded comparison and you would be a fool to even, I don't know, put that out as a meme to like trying to dunk on people. (laughs) You're just self Absolutely. reifying yourself to infinity and revealing that you don't know shit about a yeah. map or how it works. Yeah, you're actually advertising that you know nothing about maps, map creation, and longitude and latitude systems, what the Royal Society is, how projections work, or how mathematical coordinate system translations work. So if you were to say, put out a question like, hey, this flight path on this map and this compared to this map, what you're actually doing, of course, is comparing distances on different projections of the same geoid, let's call it a sphere, since all the maps from 1900 plus are all you know there's no the only valid map they let us have is the globe with various projections so if you compare those distances on each globe projection and then declare the globe winner you sound retarded huh well thanks for clearing that up because i've always heard people say where's your map flat earther where's your map we got this perfectly derived globe map that we don't know where it came from or it has conflicting coordinate systems for how the longitude was derived and don't don't mention how we got to the south and how we have a specific dude so uh, I've always heard that kind of thing. So thanks for clearing that up. Now there was one more relationship I wanted to ask you about sacred. If we have time, are, am I cutting into the intros or are we into it now? Uh, according to my time dilated clock, you are free to go. Go ahead. All right, cool. We are cleared hot. All right, Shane, let me ask you this then. So say you're out there driving the old map situation, making the old Celesti sphere. How would you establish a relationship with the pole star that you're going to use to navigate everything? Oh, man, we actually you probably align everything to it and then make sure you're always checking it. And then, you know, probably make sure that since it deforms the latitude line, you probably align your perpendicular parallel called the longitude to that. So everything would be based around that, I think. But we're measuring the ground. So if you if there was a deviation one degree per 69 miles as you walk, as you, you know, go away from Polaris, how would you describe that relationship on a flat earth, my good sir? You know, because because no. on a globe, it's se- the linearity of that relationship seems to be mutually exclusive to a globe and flat earthers can't have it. I see. I see. So what you mean is they've told us that we see linearly. So that's a linear relationship. But we can only apply, say, celestial navigation to get lineal, lineal distances using trigonometry because of that. But. Turns out that if you graph it out and you actually do the numbers and you know what 69 miles per degree is, say over what, 90 degrees of latitude, that'd be cool, what, like 6,200 miles? That's not 3,959. But anyway, if you want to navigate doing this with your little sphere of vision, you actually have to look through, uh, you know, look through your sphere to the sky and take a measure, but they only let you look above 30 and below 60 degrees, which happens to limit you to the area of this function, which is not linear, of the only linear portion. So really what it is is a logarithmic function and a logarithmic relationship between distance and visual. And what they do is restrict you to the uh, linear portion of that logarithmic expression to trick you to think that everything is linear. That's crazy. 
Hmm. So you're saying that celestial navigation in reference to the North Star and then the other reference stars that they use is done in a specific bandwidth of your vision where they can claim a linear relationship where it just happens to be in that optical range where they could do it. And then if you deviate from that, you're actually, they actually don't have a map for that. There's no reference point for that. So it's exclusively <laughs> derived for, from a point in where you, uh, optically you would have the same relationship with curved visual space that you would have with a globe earth that curves at eight inches per mile square to create the effect of uh, deviation of one degree per uh, 69 miles. Is that kind of what we're, what we're saying here that there's a direct equivalence Whoa. to your curved visual space optics and the 3959. Exactly that. And also what they're forgetting is that they're now letting people think that that is a scale that applies universally and say when they apply it to the horizon where things are not there or compressed into infinity, that makes no sense. It is not correct. When they apply it behind them to the other horizon, same thing, no effect. Directly above you, same thing. It doesn't work, no effect, doesn't tell the difference. Essentially what they've done is they've let you com take a portion of a formula and apply that to your whole life. And in reality, a logarithmic expression would explain the properties of what our vision, right? If you th see things in a sphere and they compress towards the horizon as you move away, then the objects that are no longer visible, which are there beyond your angular resolution limit, let's say, past the Rayleigh criterion of your object's eyes to resolve, then they could, in fact, said to be compressed beyond infinity, meaning that a logarithmic expression would perfectly explain and, and describe that. That's, oh, no, they wouldn't just leave it like that. Why'd they have to specifically take the linear portion of the logarithmic expression of the way we see, and they use that to apply to our navigation? That's strange. Hmm. So you're saying they gave us a specific set of a, a, equations of, to define our optics and then told us that actually everything's disappearing behind the curvature of that graph. I And then they just call it the curvature of that graph, the curvature of the earth, because we can't see behind it anyway. So it was really just a, a, uh, <laughs> Like, a, uh, like, we're just going to call your bluff on that or whatever, you know? Like, see that telescope, dude? What, what's going on with that boat? It's disappearing behind the curvature of your optics, not the curvature of yeah. of Earth. That's why when you get improved optics, oh, you can you can resolve it and bring it back into... Oh, my God, dude, this whole mystery, this whole time. Okay, so anyway, mm -hmm. so now that we know that curvature is a function of our optics, and when you plot it on a graph, there's a limit, and you could say that that would be the that that the end of that limit would be like at the horizon, right? Like log 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 bleh, logarithmically, <laughs> right? Like that's where you're going to get the most compression, right? Correct, absolutely. Yep. Interesting how all that works. So you know what I read recently that there's this thing called an azimuthal grid of vision, and it was described to me by the Royal Society of all places, right? Because that's insane. Like I've heard flat earthers talk about a personal dome, right? An azimuthal oh. grid. What 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 the heck? What the heck happened here? How how is this form, Shane? So I think what you're talking about is how when the old astronomers, of course, from the Royal Society, took their markings of the sky to prepare for the <clears throat> nonsense thing they would pull on the globe later, pull on the world later called the globe. What they did was they first, uh, they call it calibrated, right? They took their telescope, pointed at one end of the horizon as far as they could reach it, marked that on the telescope, flipped the telescope, pointed at the other end of the horizon, marking the other end of where the sky they could see, marked it on the telescope, and in so doing, denote for themselves a wonderful, exact, as a methyl grid of vision. But they don't probably know what they're doing. They only look at the stars for several hundred years. A sacred. I'm I'm sending you some stuff to throw in the jumbo as well. So so you're saying that they that they made an azimuthal grid by looking one direction in the sky and then turning 180 degrees and looking that direction and then making a dome a dome of vision right based off of that because as it turns out we don't see in Euclidean geometry. You mentioned earlier that it curved that there was this thing called curved visual space. So can can you touch more on on that and how it relates to when you take two two observation points and looking opposite to each other, how the convergence in the sky makes a dome. Like what well, I'm told that mm -hmm. we see in Euclidean geometry, brother, and that there's parallel right. light rays. How the hell is the sky converging when I look up? Right. So an aspect of your curved visual space is that it will curve light around you and or vision, right? So when you, they, 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 when the astronomers denoted the maximum and minimum like of their two ranges, they marked the border of their you know dome of vision knowing that's exactly how they they would see and what you have there is a portion would which, which would curve let's see uh a portion which would curve linearly the main of the vision you have a portion that'll curve parabolically and you have a bigger portion at the bottom that'll curve hyperbolically but the point of the vision of space 
uh, the, the tazimuthal grid of vision is that it is spherical, right? So we see literally in spherical trigonometry, they're telling us that we see linearly. We watch our vision form a dome around us and wrap you know, non-converging rays from the sun to a convergence point behind us on the opposing horizon. That's a weird phenomenon to witness until you realize that no matter what those lights are doing, your vision and the limit of your vision will work together to converge those beams behind you because that just is the limit that you can see. That's very fascinating. So you're telling me that if one were to optically, you know, take the, uh, take the, Take the spherical excess of your curved visual space and apply that to the ground. You would get, you would get, and use Gauss's theorem for that. You would get a radius of thirty nine fifty nine based off of the spherical yeah. excess. So you could actually map curved visual space to a what, what would you call it a celestial sphere, and then make deviation or any correct any deviations from that, and then use the celest use the corrections themselves to get you know spherical excess and then use that to reify the whole thing because you can get back to the <laughs> radius anyway with the with the theorem once you know how much you have any uh once you have a radius in mind anyway right yeah because if you do that out then you can tell optically you know based on the limit of the vision how much a set triangle would theoretically curve but then if you know what they're doing you can pull that curve right out and resultant figure would give you the initial radius that they used to curve it at so Again, it seems like they knew a lot of things and then used them, let's say, less than stereotypically against us. Now, I was told the guy Gauss that actually came up with that theorem and did some measurements for his country, he was actually hired by his government to make some maps and like figure out the curvature of the Earth. And he said that the curvature uh, was was not much different from zero. Now, what does that mean exactly <laughs> to be not much different? Not, I'm sorry, misquote. Mis, I, I apologize. Misquote. Let's, let's quote. Not, it, yeah. not much significantly different than zero. So, yeah. there's like, there's zero. Why right? are you flirt cherry picking? Dude, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there's there's zero, right? Where you got like nothing <laughs> on one hand, <clears throat> and then on the other hand, there's there's not there's not a significant difference in the in this hand than there is in the zero hand. <laughs> So, so optically That's... speaking, right, if you were to look across mountain peaks and take, take, take measurements to find the curvature of the earth, right, and then you're, you're, you ended up saying that it was not significantly different from zero, what, what was that, what would that mean exactly, do you think? Well, it means that there is no curvature except throughout the bottom of your eye. And if you're smart, you can know that amount it's going to curve and predict it and then use that to say, say the whole world actually curves at that rate. Kind of a crazy suggestion to think of, though, right? Hmm. Wow. That's really interesting. So you're saying in as, as early as the 18, 1850s, they started doing alley experiments where they were measuring the curved visual space on the X and Y plane. <laughs> of your depth perception to see if they intersected to prove that we don't see in Euclidean geometry and that they oh, could that's... actually take the, they could actually take measurements of that to find the excess and then get a radius and apply that to the sky. Is that what you're, and that was all done by the same guy that was hired to, to find some curvature that was not significantly different than zero. Bro. No <laughs> way. No way. Hold on. I'm starting to see a connection here. You're telling me that there's a one-to-one -one equivalence between our curved visual space, how we see reality, and how we look at the stars, and how that was mapped, and how we literally see in a latitude, in a latitude longitude system. And you're telling me that right. they mapped that to the ground and then told us that it, all curvature is based off of that. Well, wow. that's really interesting. If anyone here would like to substantiate that, that's a globularist. We're 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 available all night. Yeah, it's flat Earth Saturdays, dude. That was a good on the prompt skit to go over all the stuff we talked about all week, dude. You're pretty good at that, Ellen. Thank you, good sir. <laughs> what do you guys think? Well, I think I'm tired of long. you guys appealing <laughs> to critical thought. Stop <laughs> appealing to critical thought. You silly flirts. <laughs>